Good morning. I hope you're all well and in great spirits. I gotta say, I'm loving this spring. It's been like the best spring in like 15 years that I could think of. It rains every so often. The plants are doing good. The garden's doing good. Um, I'm loving that it's spring. It didn't just go from a cold ass winter to a hot ass summer. It's been nice. Today's video is about rap. No, I'm not going to talk about the what's Chicano rap, what's not Chicano rap, who's better this side or that side. That's, that's not me. I will say that at one time I thought that rappers who were Mexican-American, uh, Chicanos, Raza, what have you, didn't have a lot of talent. I, I didn't see it. But now, um, I do see it. I do see a lot of talent there. But again, that's not what this is about. This is about something I saw last night as it relates to rap that really stood out for me as a um, an epiphany moment. But let me take you back first. I was fortunate enough to be there at what is perceived as the birth of hip hop. Now I wasn't in New York actually, or in LA. I was here in Sacramento in a housing projects. But I remember older fools being like, hey, I just got the record. And like everybody would go into this house and they'd put this record on and it was Planet Rock. And we'd never heard any shit like that before. And everybody was just blown away. Like, that was the shit. I remember being at a Kermes. And I have to go to the Kermes Oaxaqueño today because I want to try those moles. But I remember being at a Kermes at Southside Park in Sacramento. And I lived in the housing projects next to it. And this was the early 80s. So Ronald Reagan had just given amnesty to a lot of folks. And there was this huge immigrant community in the 80s of Mexicans. And so our center for cultural and social gatherings was Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. And they would have Cinco de Mayo festivals, kermeses, what have you. And I remember being at one in Southside Park. And I was way on the other end from the stage, which is painted with you know, Cultura Murals. Um, and the message came on by Grandmaster Fash and the Furious Five. And when it came on, like, you saw all the kids perk their heads up, turn around, and they all ran to the stage. Like, everybody flocked to the stage because they wanted to hear the song. This was something that... Um, rap was new. You know, rap was new. And before even gangbanging was a thing, neighborhoods had their local uh, break dancing and pop locking crews. And sometimes they would lose the dance battle and they would fight. And a lot of these guys later went on to become gang members. So to me, that was the birth of it and the nascency. It's, it, you know, that was hip hop and rap and its nascency. And so I feel fortunate that I was there to see that. And so now, you know, part of that hip hop culture was dancing and break dancing will be in the Paris Olympics this summer. That's part of the history and it's come a long way. So now to why I made this video and how it pertains to rap. Bear with me. I take a moment to get to the point and I have to set the stage for you. So yesterday... I went to this chocolatier in um, Midtown. And this street, J Street in particular, is known kind of as a hub of social activity for yuppies in the middle class. What Guadalupe Church was to me as an immigrant, this street and this little shopping district is to the well-to-do white folks. The well-to-do anybody, not just white folks, but, you know, young people. You go there, you see a lot of uh, beautiful people. 
people who are fit, people who radiate happiness, who are living a good life. They're not worried about, you know, most of them, I'm guessing, are not worried about uh, where they're going to get the money to pay the rent. You know, they're not struggling like that. And a lot of them probably just living off generational wealth. They're not any smarter than anyone else. They're not any more talented than anyone else. They were just fortunate enough to be born into that community and a level of wealth, generational wealth. Anyways, I go to this chocolatier there on J Street and I think 24th, kind of in the heart of all the activity. And to get to it, I have to walk through this little um, patio lobby of a wine and cheese like cafe. They sell food, but the focus is wine and cheese. And so they have this little structure outside with the hanging lights and a little PA system playing music. People sitting under it all, you know, uh, healthy beautiful looking people. So I go in there and I order my chocolates. And just to give you an idea, this is the box the cupcake comes in. The cupcake was like eight bucks. Um, I went to go get my wife a box of uh, macarons or macaroons. One is a coconut thing and the other one is the little cupcake things. I'm not sure which is which, but... Um, and then I always buy myself some chocolates. So this little box of chocolates, you know, it comes with 12 chocolates, a guide so you know which ones you're getting, and um, 12 chocolates, a little bit bigger than the size of a quarter each. Each chocolate is three bucks, so this little box is 36 bucks. And I get it for me, you know, as a treat, because I like the finer things. Um, I tease my kid when she says, hey, can I get one of those chocolates? And I do share them with her. Um, I'll initially say, nah, fool, the way you study, you know, you need to go do a sampler of uh, Snickers bars and <laughs> paydays and, and peanut butter cups because you don't study hard enough and apply yourself in school for these. And so that's the atmosphere there. This is probably known as the most high-end chocolatier in Sacramento. Everything is handmade. Um, it's, it's just night and day above like a grocery store chocolate. So anyways, you know, me and my daughter, we walk through the patio and lobby of this wine bar and we go into the... Uh, Ginger Elizabeth, that's the name of the place. You know, you get a little bag. With, I mean, it's it's a high-end place. While we're in there, two, like, kind of really rich-looking old white ladies come in. Um, and, and I say that because one had a jacket, and, you know, I know the brand. And, you know, the, the folks ain't wearing a lot of jewelry, but you can kind of just tell, right? And then a young couple comes in, you know, they're fed, they look like college students, what have you. Outside, everyone sitting around is um, mostly white folks. You know, there are a couple black folks, a couple Mexican folks, a couple Asian folks scattered amongst them. But all of them look like um, they have white collar professional jobs. You can just tell these things. You know, you've been around long enough, you can tell these things. So that's the atmosphere there. They're drinking fine wines, I'm guessing. They're, they're sampling fine cheeses, I'm guessing. There's this fancy chocolatier. This is the hub of young urban professionals and well-to-do uh, old money from East Sac. This is where they all congregate. I just get the chocolate stick and move. Um, and when we walk out of there... I hear, but we don't love them hoes, bitch, and it's like that. And Snoop Dogg is bumping on the PA system. And I'm like, taken aback because 
at one time, and I'm not trying to keep it to us. I didn't make the music. You know, I'm sure Snoop loves it that they're bumping his music. But at one time, it was like the, uh, it, it, it was the audience. Those folks weren't the audience. And that's how far it's come that breaking is in the Olympics. And here in one of the most yuppiest places, you know, my daughter might joke, Dad, this is the whitest place in America right now. And and nothing against white folks. You know, I, I love white folks. Um, we cool. Um, but th there is this, also this like social economic and ethnic character to these places that never, that seems to be living the complete opposite of what's being rapped about. Um, and yet that's where it was. And it wasn't even the, um, like the radio version. You know, they were bumping the, the regular version. There's these old white ladies in there picking out their chocolates, you know, young, pretty folks drinking wine, you know, uh, Seemingly having deep philosophical conversations. They probably ain't talking about shit. Um, but Snoop's bumping in the background. And that really just... I wouldn't even call it a culture clash because they were meshing beautifully. It, it worked. And, and uh, you know, I came home and told my wife. And she's like, that's how they're edgy. And I'm like, I guess... Um, and again, I'm not hating. It's cool. I like the music. I'm there eating the chocolates. They could be like, look at this peasant motherfucker coming in here thinking he could eat our chocolates. So I ain't tripping. You know, I don't own the music or nothing. It's just me sharing my history with rap music. And that was the latest addition to my history. Seeing that and being taken aback a little by it because of the history of who embraced it and who it seemed to cater to and be geared towards for the longest amount of time. And in the end, you know, I would say that a lot of these rappers and their producers, um, they were artists, you know, that they, that's at the end of the day, that's what they were. They were artists. And the fact that it's being embraced where it was, you know, at Ginger Elizabeth and that wine and cheese bar means that the art has been appreciated universally. And them folks don't want to live that life, but they can probably say, hey, man, this guy has a way with words such that this is a poetry of the streets. And so um, that's it. That's the video on rap. Um, you know, sorry for taking so long to get to the point sometimes, but I wanted to really paint the picture of where this happened because it, it it was funny and I'll even I was going to close it but I'll go back a little bit there's this place and I think it's closing that was a gathering spot for you know people I knew that lived in Northgate which is on the north side of Sacramento um, and just it it was always a gathering place. You know, if I knew people out there and they were having an event, we'd meet at uh, Rico's Pizza. And I remember being at Rico's for uh, my cousin's uh, kid's birthday party. And Tupac was bumping on the jukebox and it was the explicit version. And there was like four birthday parties going on. And I was like, fuck, man, this is hella thugged out. Uh, that they got this music on the jukebox and these are all little kid birthday parties. And um, and even the little kid was like, he had a butter knife trying to fucking steal uh, coins out of one of the video games. It was pretty uh, hood up in there. And so that was my, my contrast also was like, when I saw that, I'm like, man, this is some hood shit to, to have this music blaring where there's little kids and at the same time, there was kids, uh, you know, running around that patio, what have you, when Snoop Dogg was playing. And uh, 
it just I don't know. I'm not, I, to me, it's a good thing in in a lot of ways, and in some ways, it's like, damn, society's just not giving a fuck no more either. All right, I'm done. Have a good one. Much love.